concerned with uh, SDG 9, that's about industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And uh, uh, why, 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 why are we bothering with that, actually? So the, we can simply say that the economic growth, social development, and climate action are heavily dependent on investment in infrastructure, sustainable uh, industrial development, and technologi technological progress. Therefore, in face of a rapidly changing global economic landscape and increasing inequality, sustained growth must include industrialization. That, first of all, makes opportunities accessible to all people. And two, is supported by innovation and resilient infrastructure. In other words, we can say that infrastructure is enabler to the industrialization process, whereas innovation, in my view, is the bloodline for any industrial process. And therefore, it makes sense to put them all in goal line, uh, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Uh, with me here in the panel are four distinguished speakers who are going to tackle these uh, aspects from different you know, points of view. And I would be helped uh, in running this session by my colleague here, Vilma, from Colombia. So my uh, first speaker is uh, Christian Mati. And uh, Christian has actually a PhD in the field of study science, technology, and innovation studies, economic geography. He is an expert in sustainability, transition, and environmental innovation. He is knowledge and learning manager at Transition Environment Innovation. Uh, sorry, uh, he. Is, he is Knowledge and Learning Manager at Transition Hub Climate KIC. So, Christian, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so, sorry, before that I should say that uh, Christian is going to talk about the innovation platforms uh, fostering communities of practice in a low carbon economy towards 2030. And by the way, I will give each uh, speaker, you know, 15 minutes question and answer. So I am determined to recover the time, Beverly. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, please. Okay, having said that, it means that, that I'm going to be fast or I'm just going to skip many slides. So uh, my presentation is about uh, the concept of uh, innovation platforms and community of practice applied in European regions, in what Europe consider moderate innovators or um, less developed regions. Uh, and the case study is the, a collection of um, innovation activities that Climate Kick developed to foster capacities for sustainable development. So actually the background is very much the approach of uh, Europe on regional development. So this is particularly clear in terms of the regional development uh, funding schemes as the ERDF funds and also as the European 2020 strategy. In this context, the Climate Kick is the largest public-private partnership in innovation in climate in, in Europe that focuses on education, entrepreneurship and innovation. And in particular, when we work with these particular regions, we work under the regional innovation scheme in less developed uh, European regions and countries. So, um, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to skip the logic of how the SDGs fit in the European policy. You just need to believe me that they start to put the SDGs in the European policy in 2001, and that is translated into European cooperation programs. So this is how it looks like the European funding scheme in agriculture and cooperation. We are currently here. Uh, that is a combination of a structural funds for uh, some particular sector with agriculture, but also with regional development with focusing regions as the main recipes for the funding. 
So I already explained that. I'm going to explain what is the innovation platform for us and how it works as a mechanism to facilitate innovation across countries in terms of climate change and low carbon economy. And I'm going to present very quick an exercise on knowledge triangle integration that is what we consider as a kind of a main practice and mechanism for supporting innovation at territorial level. So the object is, is that, it's explaining platform as a catalyzer of innovation by using also the concept of community practice and highlighting, combining uh, activities on research, education and business to realize SDG goal nine. That means innovation in industry in low carbon economy. So we are trying to, to, to see the, the resource mobilization as a kind of a main driver for a knowledge triangle integration. So I'm going to skip all the theory. Uh, so the innovation platform comes from this idea of coordinating a variety of actors uh, and also best practice and the original innovation element that is very important in, in Europe as part of the policy has to do with dealing with a complex multi-level policy scheme. So in Europe the regions are uh, um, coordinated by uh, different type of policy streams that are national and European. Uh, so there is a need for a collective understanding on how to work on that uh, topics by ba uh, basing this kind of overall background. So this is the idea of innovation platform. So we are working in low carbon economy. There are traditional sector and emergent sectors and many different type of activities in, in, run by many different programs. And we have the multi-level regulation because Europe is very complex on industry standards, firms and so on, but also we have knowledge institutions. So the innovation platform just try to mobilize resources in terms of human capital, knowledge, technology and finance. So the emerging questions from, from from our paper and from our approach is what are these kind of multi-level mechanisms that can help to uh, support technological but also social innovation, place-based innovation from the territorial point of view by considering the different uh, regional narratives and w how this process can be related with the achievement of SDG targets in terms of resource mobilization and knowledge triangle integration. So uh, the case that I'm presenting is actually this program that includes professional education, entrepreneurship and business acceleration and innovation in less developed regions. It's run by many different kicks uh, that are like a kind of program for the European Commission. I am in the climate one, but there is one in energy, one in health, there are six of them. So this is actually the, the, the countries that are covered right now and has started working in the response since 2014. So, and this is the result in terms of the SDGs. So we are focusing here and as you can see, they are very much in orange and red not very much in green. So what we are trying to do is try to help them to uh, get better indicators on them based on this idea of knowledge platforms. So this is the kind of activities that we do. And so each of these icons represent five. So you can see, for example, accelerator startups, a, a professional education, professional mobility from country to country, and pathfinder projects that are experimental projects at very local level. So all these countries have been performed in a different way in terms of these different elements of innovation. So we are trying to gather the idea of systemic innovation, but not just focusing in startups and companies, as we discussed in the other panel before, but also in terms of competence and skills and the long-term logic of the transformative system, for example, in mobility in retrofitting in housing or for example in water management. So that requires different type of instruments to uh, be combined from a systemic point of view. So there are different learning processes because they start in different uh, moments but there is all these programs work under cross-border relations. So this is something very important for us is that they are having similar problems but different contexts, but still they can share and they can work together. So for example, the mobility programs uh, support the mobility of professionals from different sectors. From if the person is from public sector, they go to a company. If they are from a company, they go to a university or public sector. And, and this is the idea of having a systemic uh, understanding of low carbon economy from a, a territorial perspective. So, yes. So, um, 
what I'm going to present very briefly is that we need to understand much better how knowledge triangle integration works in these regions. And we have done like a study uh, by uh, um, a series of interviews to understand what are the key dimension of knowledge triangle integration to support innovation. So, sorry. So the key variables are the perspective, the culture and organization, resources and experience and activities of all these regions. And all the dimension that you see there are variables. We have done an interview and codify uh, with content and discourse analysis and pro produce indicators uh, under four potential scenarios. So they can be in different stage of the knowledge triangle integration performance. They can be running just collaborative project that means that it's not very mature or can be like what we call orchestrated innovation ecosystem that is a high level of knowledge triangle integration. This is very much based in the logic of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology that is the main European program that support this program. So we have achieved this. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the numbers because I do not have time and I really want to focus in the conclusions. So what we see is that there are countries like, for example, Portugal that are performing very well in uh, all the indicators, but something that is very important for us in terms of how we design the platforms in terms of community of practice is that all the countries perform very well in experience and activities. So of course it's very difficult to think in transition to low carbon economy and a vision for a system innovation approach. That means perspective, culture and organization and even identifying the resources, something that has been very much discussed here. But we see that we can work much better in terms of understanding the very good practice that we can uh, 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 develop with them in a cross-border collaboration. So in terms of the Conclusion. So um, there are some institutional aspects uh, in terms of uh, enabling different uh, interfaces. So we really are supporting innovation management capacities. When they work together, government, university and industry, it's not so easy to help them in terms of identify long-term priorities, knowledge commercialization, but also having actually some goals that are not related with profit at all. Okay, so this is very much a day-by-day um, um, -day actions on innovation management. Regarding the innovation performance, yes, we have improved a lot what is the evaluation and the analytical framework that they use to understand what is what they achieve in terms of different type of results because we can see skills and competence, people train, projects done, professional mobility, startups. So there are different indicators, more bottom up, but they are much better in terms of uh, follow up. And finally, there is a fluctuation between country and that's the overall idea of uh, regional innovation and, and territory, is that no one size fits all. So we need to understand much better each narrative. So these problems are tailor made and with partners in each region. So there is no like a common recipe to do professional education in each country. We co-design with them each of the programs. And this is part of the logic of understanding regional innovation systems. So in general, we can say that we are supporting and the resource mobilization has to do with four main action lines. Mobility of professionals, understand much better how to create capa uh, human capital and capa capabilities in innovation process. Education in terms of the new skills and competence that you need in low carbon economy. So the architects of the past are not the architects of the future. So just to give you an example, so the social elements and the knowledge triangle integrations require other type of competence and skills that we approach through new knowledge in professional education. Accelerator, trying to find technology in some finance from the kind of uh, the very bottom-up point of view. But this is still is a cross-border collaboration. So startups working in one region can solve problems in another region. Finally, finally Pathfinder projects. Actually, Pathfinder is just the first stage in Climate Kick and the EIT, we have like a pipeline that moved from Pathfinder to Accelerator, Demonstrator, to Scale Up. This is a long process, especially when you consider that you are working in the same innovation projects with companies, governments, and universities. So there is a kind of a storyline about innovation that is not actually related with profits at first. It's more related with how you achieve some kind of new capacities at territorial level. 
So this is kind of the results of, uh, but I'm, not, I'm going to skip this, and I'm just going to go to the final remarks. So we realize that there is a demand to increase innovation capacity from a completely different point of view, that is from a bottom-up point of view. It's like co-designing and co-implemented with local partners, activities, but also uh, create linkages between countries and with the European discussion. So all these countries are funded for uh, European development, for regional development with European funds. So there is this kind of complexity of doing the mismatch between regional priorities and European speech. But that should be done locally. So the logic of platforms helps to reconcile some, some way this idea of macro indicator with the community of practice micro elements because knowledge is embedded in people and the the kind of logic is systemic because we work at platform level is spatial through territories and different thematic elements so these are the different areas in which we are working urban transitions land use finance and production system regarding measuring sdg 9 performance we have been working on studying what is the targets for sdgs and all how we can help actually our regions to understand how they advance in sustainable development. So what we are trying to say here is that we are providing them like bottom-up process to understand what they are achieving in terms of competence and innovation. And this is kind of very important issue in terms of climate change. There's no recipe for climate change to measure progress as there is in food sector or energy or even production system. It's more complex. So I think the bottom-up process is something that is very much required when you think in sustainable development regarding local economies. The final conclusion, because I have one minute and I think I have done very well, is that um, we have been working in process-based indicators, not in like static indicators, so how you produce new competence and skills or institutional capacity to run knowledge triangle integration between different sectors cannot be achieved by static indicators. It's like an evolutionary process. So you develop new regional innovation systems, uh, as the literature said, when you understand how the actors articulate much better. So this is something different from the type of indicators that are static and be comparable. Yes, the bad news is that this, this is difficult in terms of comparisons, but it's something that you need to consider in terms of measure the progress of the regions in terms of sustainable development. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. Okay. I, I can see the big. Thank you very much, Christian. I can see, you know, immediately the value of having this uh, innovation uh, platform. And uh, although now it is in Europe, which I consider as a pilot, I think it can easily be globalized, you know, in the future, which uh, will add benefit, you know, to. Uh, other uh, countries as well as other fields of knowledge as well. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions to Christian, please? I can allow one or two questions. Yeah, please. Um, I was just cu curious whether your organization and yourself are working on helping the EU countries prepare for next year. As you know, next year, th that's the first four-year period is coming up and all our, our countries who have signed up to the SDGs are supposed to review uh, implementation and success of implementation. The question is, what method to use? It's uh, something that's still to be, it's urgent actually, but it's something that we need to come to terms with. Are you working on that? And if so, to what extent uh, have you been able to make progress within the EU context? So I think it's, it's a very good question and something that we need to do is to decouple what we are doing from the kind of institutional arrangements. So we are very much uh, aligned with the Europe 2020 strategy that are connected with the UN SDG goals. And next year, uh, Europe is going to have the 2050 strategy on climate change. So, and this is going to be very much aligned with the SDGs, and this is our umbrella of objectives and targets. So at institutional levels, we are trying to link what we do with other kind of logics, like, for example, the SDG goals. But we are under the umbrella of EU, and actually the targets 
for the uh, European countries are even higher under the 2020 strategy in some particular cases with related to low carbon economy. Thank you, Chris. I, I, think, I think I'll move uh, to the next uh, uh, you know, presentation. Uh, is there any other question there, urgent one? Uh, but please be very brief because I need to move to the next one. Yes, go on. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, what I'm going to say is <laughs> NEXT does not represent the United Nations, although I work with the organization. Um, in June last year, the 45th, 45th president of the United, uh, uh, United States pulled America out of the um, Climate uh, Paris Accord. In doing so, it had actually made America a para nation, officially killing multilateralism, which has been the cornerstone of international development and progress. The EPA <coughs> Secretary Pritt, Scott Pritt also said, we do not owe no apologies to all other nations for our environmental stewardship. Having said that, I would like to come, uh, thank the EU for taking leadership in the climate change effort. This is not, a uh, this is not going to be a question, this is just a statement. And I would like to conclude by saying what uh, the French, pres French President uh, Emmanuel Macron said after President Trump pulled out. He said, make our planet great again. And I would like to thank the European Union for taking leadership in these sustainable development goals and making it work. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored that you consider me a representative of the European Union, but I'm not. But since I'm based in Brussels, I will, uh, they actually the Commission know that I'm here, so I will transmit your words uh, to the right people. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. I just want to remind everybody that, you know, the uh, recovering the lost time is a partnership, just to embrace the uh, theme of the thing. It's a partnership between the moderators, the speakers, and the audience. So uh, I, I would urge, you know, my partners, the speakers, uh, you know, to be brief, and the questions is even, you know, well, to keep to time, and the audience to be, you know, very brief in their questions. My uh, next uh, uh, speaker uh, is uh, Hala, Hala Waraj. Uh, and Hala is actually uh, has been an acting registrar at the American University of Beirut since August 2017. She has worked in higher education and student services for 22 years. Hala graduated with a PhD in political science from the Lebanese University in November 2017. And she is going to talk about individual factors affecting administrative innovation in Lebanon. So it is a specific case for Lebanon. Yes, Go yes on, it is. <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, so um, I'm going to tackle innovation uh, from a behavioral aspect. Um, as uh, 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 Mr. Chairman just said that this study is uh, a part of my PhD dissertation uh, uh, completed uh, in uh, November 2017. Uh, and uh, therefore, I represent myself. I don't represent any official uh, authority. Uh, okay. So, uh, without administrative development, the bureaucracy cannot keep up uh, with social and economic challenges. As put in the SDGs, innovation advances the technological capabilities of industrial sectors and prompts development of new skills. So my presentation will concentrate on the innovation uh, among uh, the Lebanese civil servants in order to play a forceful role in Lebanon's social and educational development during the coming decades. Uh, this presentation has uh, two objectives. The first objective is to provide an empirical assessment of the innovation level uh, among uh, civil servants in Lebanon. And the second objective is to test uh, the impact uh, of factors such as uh, age and education 
on uh, bureaucratic innovation. So mainly there are three questions, research questions that uh, this uh, presentation will have to answer. First, uh, the first question is what factors are associated with higher levels of behavioral innovation? Uh, question number two, does age and education affect behavioral innovation? And the third question, how can behavioral capacity uh, be strengthened? Uh, for this reason, uh, innovation was measured uh, using uh, five indicators. The first indicator is uh, the uh, level of creativity uh, among employees. The second indicator is the level of risk-taking. The third indicator is uh, the predisposition of employees to accept new ideas. The fourth indicator is uh, the predisposition of employees to challenge traditional values. And the fifth indicator is um, the predisposition of employees to be involved in creative decision making. So, uh, in uh, Answering, uh, uh, trying to answer the first uh, question, actually, um, uh, before I start this, I should say that uh, uh, the data was collected. I did a survey uh, in September 2016, which was administered to uh, uh, public civil servants uh, in Lebanon, and uh, uh, I collected uh, the results. So. Uh, the results showed that uh, there is a low level of innovation uh, among uh, the employees. Uh, there was a moderate level of uh, creativity. Uh, there was a low level of risk-taking, uh, a low level on taking, uh, being involved in creative decision making. Employees do not accept uh, they are reluctant to accept new ideas. Uh, however, what was surprising is that uh, they were uh, willing to engage in uh, social change. Uh, in answering the second question, whether there is a relationship between age and innovation, and between education and innovation? Well, it turned out that there is an inverse relationship between age and innovation. Uh, results showed that as uh, age of employees uh, increase, the level of creativity, challenging new ideas, creative decision making, taking risky decisions uh, decrease. Uh, however, there was a direct relationship between education and innovation. So the more educated the employees, the higher the innovation levels were among um, uh, Lebanese civil servants. So there was a direct relationship between the level of education uh, on the one hand and between the level of risk taking, uh, challenging traditional values, creative decision making. Uh, on the other hand. So uh, basically, uh, how can um, uh, this moderately, uh, this low innovation among employees be explained? Um, first of all, um, concentration of authorities uh, is in the hands of the upper management in Lebanon, uh, mainly because uh, managers uh, are compensating for uh, the lack of skilled workers. Uh, this, uh, I collected this information based on interviews from managers in uh, uh, the public sector. Uh, so uh, this leaves the higher administration overburdened with uh, routine work and unable to concentrate on strategic uh, goals. Uh, and also, uh, uh, this uh, uh, tends, uh, so subordinates also, they tend to avoid um, uh, decision making and they tend to delegate uh, um, uh, decisions to their subordinates. And second, uh, there are cultural impediments influencing innovation, uh, which preside mainly in the attitudes and um, a predisposition that employees bring to their work. Um, the Lebanese society is a traditional society where uh, 
um, achievement does not emanate from internal drive, but rather from family and sect, especially in the public sector. Uh, so uh, since innovation is a prerequisite for achievement, then um, uh, employees might not, might not be as innovative as their Western counterparts, especially that change is not accepted easily in uh, our uh, culture, in the Lebanese culture. So uh, basically, um, the, regarding the conclusions, we can, um, there are three conclusions that can be uh, uh, relate. First of all, uh, the public service needs more work and enhancements to c keep on providing social services for an increasing population in the future. And um, uh, some of the deficiencies of the bureaucracy, they find their roots in the culture of um, Lebanon. And third, uh, that uh, on a more optimistic point, uh, on a more optimistic tone, uh, recruiting young and educated uh, employees based on their competency levels uh, may alleviate the behavioral problem and may lead to uh, improved uh, performance. And finally, uh, some recommendations in order to improve uh, innovation. Uh, first of all, uh, wages and salaries, uh, I think they should be increased to the point of having an adequate standard of living, uh, as well as it is a prerequisite uh, for recruiting of the recruitment of good employees. And uh, the government has taken uh, a step towards this, and uh, the salaries in the public sector have been um, uh, more or less uh, uh, been adjusted. Uh, second, uh, recruitment should stress uh, quality in the public sector. Recruiting people with high growth needs uh, should be the target. And um, uh, thirdly, uh, some employees uh, are willing to take responsibility. And uh, I think that supervisors must cater to uh, their needs in order to stay motivated uh, on the job. Uh, here we're talking about the intrinsic values. Um, and fourth, um, uh, I think that uh, employees, uh, an update or an efficient employee is a um, an updated employee. Employees should uh, uh, be involved more in uh, training, attending training, workshops uh, related to uh, their fields uh, of study. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Short. <laughs> that's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, I think uh, it's really inspiring because, I mean, we, we used to hear about, you know, the civil service and lack of innovation, but uh, we never had, uh, you know, a scientific evidence for that. Uh, I know your uh, evidence may not be uh, generalized everywhere, no, but not. there are so many countries in the world like Lebanon, which I think uh, countries uh, in the developing world in particular need to take uh, care of that and take no note of it take and action. act upon it yeah. because... Uh, uh, without, uh, you know, efficient and innovative uh, civil servants, as if you are actually driving a motorcycle with uh, one wheel. So I think it's very important. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any questions? Any questions from the floor to Hala? How much time do we have? Uh, Look, 10 minutes. No, it's okay. Yeah. 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Any, any questions at all? Okay. If, if there are no questions, uh, uh, if there are no question here, then I can actually move to the uh, third uh, presentation, uh, which would be uh, given by uh, Professor Abdul Qadir uh, Juflat, and uh, Professor Juflat is a very well-known uh, name in the field of academia. He was appointed full professor in economics at the University of Oran in Algeria in 1992 where he held the position of Dean of the Faculty of Economics, Chairman of Scientific Council, and member of the Scientific Board of the Center of Applied Economics for Development. He currently works at the University of Lille in France, where he teaches Industrial and Development Economics, and is Senior Fellow at the uh, Claire's Laboratory. Is that correct uh, pronunciation? <laughs> yes. And uh, he is the founder and current Chairman of the MAG Tech, MAG here for Maghreb, uh, Maghreb Technology Network. 
and uh, Professor uh, Yuflat is going to talk to us about promoting sustainable industrialization and foster innovation through a PPP in Africa. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am very happy to be here, and I would like to uh, thank uh, the Joint Unit and Petru Dimitri and uh, WASD and my friend Anne Lamp for inviting me. Indeed, I belong to this network and uh, another one network, which is GlobalX, uh, which is more international network. And uh, basically, uh, uh, we haven't done uh, actually uh, uh, empirical work, so this is just a, a research agenda uh, starting. But I thought, as I was invited to share some of the preliminary thought with you and uh, see uh, how you react. So um, uh, the issue is, of course, um, promoting sustainable industrialization and uh, basically uh, thinking around the uh, SDG 9, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation but more precisely on the issue of uh, sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. I will not look at uh, infrastructure this time because I believe, uh, as it, uh, the UN General Secretary said, without technology and innovation, industrialization will not happen and without industrialization, sustainable development will not happen. But of course, a lot of academic work has also been done around the issue of necessity of industrializing Africa, Roderick and so forth. So I think this is an issue which everybody agrees upon, that we have, Africa has to go a, a big way into industrialization. And uh, SDG 9, of course, has got targets, and I will not go through these targets, you could read them. Some targets are around industry, some others on, around innovation issues, and some others about ICT targets. So time will not be enough to, uh, to explain them. Uh, of course, uh, it is a matter of inclusive and sustainable innovation driven industrial development. I see it as uh, put uh, forward by uh, some institution. And uh, of course, it's a whole range of issues and objectives going from poverty reduction, employment, wastage, uh, avoiding wastage of resources, uh, environment degradation, and education and entrepreneurship. Uh, for innovation. So uh, some of the key issues is, of course, how, is import, how important is uh, the SDG 9 to the development of Africa, because I think it's an important, uh, it's an opportunity to, 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 to raise this question and what is the situation, what could PPP play, uh, role could be played to enhance and accelerate SDG 9, what avenues, potential synergies, and what issues and challenges. As you could see, there are a lot of questions, so I may not have the answers to all, but at least the, 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 uh, it is uh, the time to raise. SDG, great of great importance for Africa, of course. I mean, uh, if you look by all standards, uh, Africa uh, is not performing well uh, on the industrial uh, side. If you look at the manufacturing value added uh, and uh, uh, on the innovation scores, if you look at, uh, though we are not performing. Uh, even worse, some uh, African countries which started industrializing, excuse me, uh, in fact have gone uh, downturn. They are deindustrializing because of a variety of reasons. I will not go uh, into uh, this time. So. Uh, 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 all these are, of course, in figures. I, there is no need to go all the statistics because they are all here to confirm what I have said, and time is, uh, is, uh, is very short. And uh, also on the knowledge uh, issue, uh, Africa is not necessarily doing uh, good compared to the other uh, continents. And some of the work we have done uh, to link innovation, uh, sustainability, or environment protection and knowledge harnessing uh, clearly shows there is a correlation between the two. Uh, in other words, the more you are uh, knowledgeable and the higher you have the chance to protect the environment. This is but just a preliminary. So uh, the need for, of public-private partnership for SDG implementation is raised as an issue. Of course, the first thing is uh, this deficit, major deficit in terms of uh, funding and in terms of performances. The progress or assessment of the progress made in SDGs uh, in 2017, 
shows uh, on all uh, uh, grounds, all indicators, manufacturing, R&D, technological complexity, ICTs, uh, Africa is, of course, not performing well. Um, uh, and that is uh, uh, an issue which, uh, of course, everybody has already acknowledged and shown in uh, previous uh, interventions. Uh, so I'll not do. But uh, PPP is not only about funding, it's not only about statistics, figures, it's also, uh, also uh, about, about uh, other issues which are related to, which have been largely covered, but I will raise them again. It's about, of course, um, shared objectives, mutual invest, uh, investment, risk sharing, value, trust, because we are talking in, uh, on very uh, delicate aspect, innovating, and innovating is a lot of interacting between actors, and unless there is trust, of course the PP will not, will not be uh, there to support innovation. But of course when you are talking about a PPP, then you have to uh, choose what kind of models. I think there are about 25 mods of PPP, so what, which one is adequate for Africa, and is there only one adequate for Africa? That, and also uh, the mode of governance uh, and the right blend of, financials, of finance. Uh, PPP for SDG in Africa, uh, some of the, we, uh, this, is, this has been already covered because there are a lot of complementarities. First, within the, uh, the, the goals themselves. And you could see that if you look carefully at uh, SDG 9 and uh, SDG 17, <coughs> uh, which is partnership, has been <coughs> largely uh, uh, presented here, you saw a lot of uh, SDG 9 uh, objectives are already embedded in SDG 17. So one of the, that's why uh, the silo approach, which uh, of course we have to be against, is not the right thing to do. It's really kind of some synergy between the, the various goals. And of course it, 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 it covers financial issues, technology and capacity building. And if I had time I would go de in detail. But my paper in the, uh, is in the book and I think you could uh, read that in more details. But also the other agendas, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda also, uh, present some of uh, uh, the uh, recommendations which are geared towards uh, advancing, furthering the uh, SDG 9, uh, uh, acknowledging the same handicap of technology divide. Then you have also research capacity building, innovation enabling environment, entrepreneurship, and of course uh, the mode of mobilizing the fin finances and, and some of the institutional mechanisms which are, uh, which are presented. If we examine also the Africa uh, 2063 agenda, at least the first 10 years of implementation up to, uh, to 2023, of course you have also some elements which complete and can further the uh, goals of industrialization and innovation, uh, it says in a nutshell, well-educated citizens and skills, uh, revolution uh, in the pinned by science, technology, innovation, sustainable and inclusive economic growth, STI-driven industrialization, economic diversification are some of the. And the scaling up of financing for the first 10 years goes exactly in the same direction as SDG would want it in terms of activities, resources, uh, government, pure commercial finance, FDI, portfolio, and so on, and level of intermediation. So there is a need to connect and get the uh, synergies between SDG 9, as it is, uh, as we know it, and the other programs put forward by the other institutions like NEPAD and African Union, whatever. There's a lot of uh, synergy to be created, and that is also a positive to further the objectives and the targets of SDG 9. So now, uh, uh, of course, uh, Christian um, talked about the systemic uh, approach and vision and also uh, go along those lines, I think. Uh, why? Because the, uh, first of all, the, some of the preliminary work done uh, by uh, Alison Warhurst on the uh, copper industry in, uh, in Zambia, I was raising this point, showed that PPP is much larger than just simply public, private, uh, uh, bodies uh, interacting or collaborating. There are so many other actors which are involved in, that, uh, uh, in those issues of copper mining 
Of course, they, 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 they include the, uh, the CSOs, the, uh, uh, the society, all the uh, organizations for, for defending the, 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 the rights of the, of, of, the, of the citizens. We have the donors, we have government, of course, uh, research sphere, industry sphere, financial, international organizations, of course, we have talked about it. And these multi-partner, multi-stakeholders challenges uh, really uh, go in the direction of having a systemic, and this, of course, has been said earlier. We've done uh, some empirical work, not on uh, SDGs and, and sustainability, but simply on uh, innovation systems and dynamics. Uh, we took several, looked at several countries, both in North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, and it seems one of the uh, outstanding conclusions that there are no systems there. Which, which works according to uh, the systemic vision, which is, of course, making uh, performances in, in, in both in developed advanced countries and some emerging countries. And particularly, if you look at this sphere as the system, you see a lot of key actors actually excluded from the system, including SMEs, including civil society, but uh, enterprises. And the whole issue, how to get all these stakeholder of these actors within the system that is one of the and uh, so that it could look like this because unless you have some coordination uh, interaction uh, and of course some people called even talked about coalition and uh, you see how this interaction of this uh, between uh, all the various uh, key uh, players and stakeholders had to be dense and intense. This is actually an example taken from an advanced country. And this is a type of uh, model which uh, we would aim at if we wanted really to innovation to serve sustainable development goals. And simply that innovation is uh, a key element driving industrialization and in particular manufacturing, because we're not talking about the extractive industry. And uh, of course, uh, there are two or three, thank you, two or three points I would raise. One, the, uh, the informal economy. I mean, we talked about it. And uh, uh, we uh, had uh, some research done in our network, and we see that uh, a big proportion of the manufacturing and, uh, is out of the formal sphere. So that is important. But on the other hand, there are a lot of success stories within the informal economy. I've done some uh, work in the global X, and it shows so how can you put, sorry, how can you actually get uh, uh, that uh, creativity, uh, that potential, those synergy to be uh, geared towards advancing, furthering sustainable uh, development goals. And last but not least, but there are so many other issues I've just selected because of, uh, of time. Uh, the diaspora participation challenges to SDG uh, uh, 9 in Africa. And uh, we believe, as you see, the figures are staggering, estimate 53 billion US dollars. But it's not only uh, money, it's about knowledge, it's about creativity, it's about entrepreneurship. There's a huge potential. And I think the, actually the SDG 9 give us and give the African government the opportunity to really think hard how to get this potential back to the country through various means to be able to achieve SDGs on time. This is a historical opportunity to get uh, really the uh, diaspora in the game. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Sorry if okay. I have been through. No, that's all right. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. It's really interesting, you know, to. Uh, see somebody advocating, you know, industrialization of Africa after being, you know, asleep for many centuries. I think it's time for that giant, uh, you know, to wake up and uh, contribute its share to the uh, world economy and particularly industrialization. Uh, any question? Yes, uh, Prof. Thank you very much indeed for your very good presentation. Actually, uh, in Sudan we have the experience of uh, uh, public-private partnership in 1980s we have a big company called Kunana Sugar Company it was a very wonderful combination of uh, partnership between uh, public sector and private sector around the globe and very successful and they brought very high technology and we have if you have hundred uh, companies like Kunana we should be fully destroyed by this country by this time but unfortunately Theoretically, yes, we can say anything as you plan, but practically to apply anything in Africa is very difficult. 
the most common problem in Africa is institutional failure. Uh, good governance, rule of law. All these problems actually will prevent anybody who is living in diaspora like us uh, to implement theoretically whatever about industrialization or any type of economic system because they are very serious and fundamental problem in Africa. Number one is institutional failure. We don't have any institution, not physical institution. I mean the government, they are not working as in one institute. It's based on individual and individualism. So it's very difficult to implement anything. And I, one of the Sudanese council expert who are living abroad and I have proposed Sudan Knowledge Economy Foundations. Theoretically, I presented everything when we come to the implementation. Nobody is ready to listen to anything. So how you are going to apply all this wonderful policy framework and all the process you have mentioned in, in Africa? OK, th thank you, Sadiq. Uh, yes, Prof, uh, do you want to comment? An observation. It's more an observation than you go along the lines because it, it, it is a systemic failure as well. When I present, talked about the system of innovation. One of the reasons why these systems are not working in a systemic way is because of institutional failure. So it's throughout, I think, why the SMEs are not being committed, involved in doing and in, in diversifying the economy. It is also institutional failure. So it is uh, throughout the issues, that is of course the common theme unfortunately, and this is part also of, of innov innovating new systems which can overcome the systemic failure. But at least we, 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 we identify where the problems are, that is it. Thank you for your... Thank you, I think there is a question there. Yes, I promise to come back to you. <laughs> Yes, sorry, it took some time. Uh, so I was wondering, do you believe that during the course of, of development uh, of these ecosystems in Africa, that we will see a maintained high level of participation of the citizens? And what I mean is like right now you have numbers between 15 and 30 percent of the population uh, starting companies, which is rather high compared to Europe or, or America, for example. Is that something that can be maintained? Yeah, uh, well, uh, um, maintaining a system is to have the enabling environment, the right environment. So one of the important issues now, how to bring that environment which can make it sustainable, because uh, you have struggling figures, people creating uh, startups and, and companies. But look at the other side with the next five years. How many failures? How many people leave the market, actually? Because this is an important issue you have to tackle. Is the environment enabling those uh, companies to actually diversify, to innovate, and uh, to participate to SDG goals? Okay. Thank you. Just uh, lo the last question, I think, there, and then I'll move on. Yeah. Oh, pl please be brief and quick. Thank you very much. Uh, chairman, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Jafla, for a very interesting and a very significant paper. Because if we recall the, the size of informal economy around the world in many different countries, uh, it's very sizable. So if we could somehow, you know, through an innovation system to bring the informal sector to be formalized and we create sustainable job, I think, you know, we're making a major contribution to sustainable development. And then my question to you is really, you know, when, we, when you look at this very complex innovation ecosystem that you just mapped out, and I wonder what, what is and what could be the man knowledge management system that be put into place in order to generate something which we can replicate and scale up further. Uh, my name is Li Jia Sen, you from Center for Socioeconomic Development. Thank you. 
Thank you for a very interesting uh, question. And in fact, when I talked about uh, getting away from silos, I was referring to a work which you presented yesterday. Excellent work. No, no, I, I think it's, um, it's uh, an issue. So innovation system, anyhow, it's, uh, it's only part of the knowledge system. It's not disconnect, but this is because innovation, uh, unlike, I mean, there was some debate yesterday. It's not something which is top down. It's innovation throughout the, you know, at lower uh, grade in, within the, the, the enterprise, or all this tacit knowledge which you have to mobilize, what the, my Alborg friend called the DUI, doing, using, interacting. This is uh, how to harness. If you can harness that, then you are more or less in the knowledge economy and ro recognizing that things become obsolete. So I, I don't disconnect them. I think one is just a part of furthering the other. Thank okay, you. Th thank you very much, uh, Prof. I think uh, I want to move. It is interesting that we start with Europe, then we went to the Middle East, Africa, and now we will go to the Gulf uh, region. Uh, which would be interesting with actually having research and development collaboration between the Northern Municipal Council and local universities in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And our presenter is Mahmoud al -Afia. He holds uh, BSc in Software Engineering University of British Columbia, Canada, uh, collaboration with uh, Aptec Institute, Bahrain, and an MBA from Ahliya University, Bahrain. He presented the idea of research and development in municipal council in the Kingdom of Bahrain. The floor is yours, Mahmoud. Uh, thank you, Professor Adil. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, all of you. I would like to introduce myself. I am Mahmoud Al Afia. I am. I work in the Northern Municipal Council in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Municipal councils in Bahrain elected free direct election every four years. The municipal councils of the Kingdom of Bahrain arose during the reform era under the region, under the reign of His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa. And this research is a practical project to support this reform era. The title is Research and Development Collaboration between the Northern Municipal Council and local universities in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Ladies and gentlemen, the room here is full of researchers and thinkers from different sectors, from different countries. Please, I will ask you a question. Participate with me. Do you have R&D department in your organization? Please raise your hand if you have R&D department. Yes? Yes? Oh, oh, good. Well, well, very good. But for us, we don't. We don't have research and development department. But today, I'm going to show you how we conducted and con conducted many research and studies without research department, without researchers, and with zero budget. <laughs> yes, how it can be? Let's go through this presentation. The content of this presentation will start by analyzing the problem, then uh, finding the solution, after that results, recommendations, and finally the conclusion. One day, I visited my manager, my president, the president of the municipal council, Mr. Muhammad Khalifa Bahmoud. I talked with him about the importance of research and development, saying that research and development is the foundation of evolution and progress. And every evaluation of sector or seek, seeking progress is definitely seeking applying this principle. Then I asked him why we don't apply this. He replied, we don't have budget. Then I suggested using the concept of public-private partnership PPP. And from this transformation point, and after I get the support from my president, the Northern Municipal Council after that, is not as before. 
First, we begin by identifying the needs of various committees and sections of the municipal council and found that there are 51 requirements for conducting studies. Here is the percentage in front of you for the distribution for each department of the council. But the question is that how it conducted these, how can we conduct these studies? The purpose of this study is to develop a solution to the problem of the Northern Municipal Council to do R&D. And here we want practical things, not theoretical. And this is what we understand, to come to the UN to have evidence for changing our culture, changing our events. What is the problem? The problem is that Northern Municipal Council has lacked financial means to conduct studies to their needs. It's also lacked researchers within the council to conduct studies. On the other hand, uh, the university's students need the real issues to conduct studies to finalize their graduation. And also, doctors also, they need real topics. Let's go to analyze the problem. Here, you see, this is municipal council, we. We don't have R&D, no departments, no budget, no researchers, but we have real issues. We are wealthy in topics. On the other hand, the universities. Universities has R&D, faculties, budget, full of researchers, but they need real issues. They need practical topics. While we use PPP, we can share our needs to their needs. Putting our needs and the university's needs, we realize that the solution lies in the partnership and cooperation between the two sides. The Municipal Council will provide the university's researchers and topics who will investigate these topics and provide their studies and findings to the Municipal Council. And we will get, we will get the useful research. What we did. For more explanation, Municipal Council will send topics to universities and universities will conduct research and submit them to the Municipal Council through coordinating and follow up. And this is the typical relationship between Northern Municipal Council and universities. We will use when to when between us and universities. Uh, 12 universities were contacted and uh, meetings were set with different professors and top managements in each universities. They welcomed our idea and their willingness to cooperate in conducting the studies and research. What is the result? Is there any evidence? Yes. Agreements were signed with seven universities and the rest is in the progress. And the question is that is it subject of just signing agreements? No. A number of projects and ideas were agreed. Here we have a problem in this vital tourist location. The palm tree in this area has a problem in their growing since around 30 years. And still they are like this. You know that the palm, the palm tree has a niche in that region in GCC. After this partnership and cooperation with Gulf, Arabian Gulf University, with their specialist professors and uh, qualification people in agriculture and uh, for their ability of labs and high quality of instruments, they con conducted a study for us, finding the reasons and suggestions to solution and submitted to us. Also, two studies by Royal University 
for women. The opinion of the northern audience to the performance of the municipal council. Another thing, they con conducted a study on the budget of the municipal council and submitted to us. Another thing, it is uh, in the same university, uh, Royal University for Women, they design a walking area in the northern region. They make competition between their uh, students. They conclude by 16 art designs for an walking area in the northern region. Research and more. It is not just research and studies. We said it is a package of partnership. Arabian Gulf University agreed with us to conduct a strategic planning for the Northern Municipal Council. They will submit this in this month. Also, Gulf University designed and implemented different programs for improving our employees' skills, and this is one of them. All universities uh, also put their all facilities in our disposal. And many projects in a progress, workshops on human resources and preparation of the general budget, designing optimized garbage collection system, participate in several conferences with universities, a drawing a smile project, and many projects. Situation analysis. From the analysis of the situation, we found that there are opportunities in favor of applying this idea and seizing these opportunities, especially with the presence of our president, Mr. Mohammed Khalifa Bouhmoud, the president of the Municipal Council, who strongly support this cooperation and convinced that it will only bring good results. Besides that, the encouragement of Minister of Municipalities, Mr. Isam Khalaf, uh, government laws also support the universities conducting scientific research. However, we found that there are challenges in the community, lack of staff, no budget, uh, and also uh, difficulty in collaboration with some parties. And also when the term of the members of the municipal council, as I said, every four years, if it is end, it may lead to the termination of this idea. In order to maintain the work and achievements, uh, we need uh, or we recommend the following, to allocate a hand to manage research and development, cooperation between universities and the public sector. The step needs to be sustained in productivity in order to convince a higher support. Uh, there should be government leg legislation that sets the minimum level of research in ministries. R&D uh, depends on the uh, central role in the balancing the performance. What can we conclude? The idea is achievable. Many positive results have been achieved. Prosperity achieved both for the Northern Municipal Council and for the country in general. This will ignite competition among various sectors of the government and lead to overall development. And finally, participate in uh, implementing SDG. We can see that if we participate in quality education, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, uh, partnership for the goals. And finally, I will ask you, do you think this idea and the project participate in the goal number nine of innovation. I will let it to you. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Many thanks from Kingdom of Bahrain to all of you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, Mahmoud. It's not just a, a different region, but also a different, uh, you know, sort of application of PPP, which is very interesting in the field of R&D. Uh, which can be very interesting and useful uh, to many uh, other countries in that region and beyond. And uh, I open the floor for questions. Yes, Beverly. Yes, I have two questions. There. Okay. 
Uh, you're doing it with the government. Have you thought about expanding to NGOs, the universities working with NGOs, as well as municipal governments as a partnership? The university is working with municipals or with government. I'm suggesting, have you thought about the universities working with NGOs? Yes. Yes, actually, the distinction of this uh, cooperation, uh, it is free of charge. And uh, we have got a lot of benefits in different manners. And uh, this is the practical thing of implementing SDGs. Yeah, yeah, and even the government also. Yeah. yeah, yeah so I, I think in the place of, like, like, like Bahrain, if in I say my take here, yeah. I mean, uh, yes. Oh, okay, yes, okay. I'll come back to you, Ali, if you want to add anything. Okay. <clears throat> So I would like first to answer your question and then I will go to, since I'm here also representing Ali University from, you know, from Bahrain. I'm Dr. Engie, Assistant Professor in Management. I'm the MBA Director at Ahli University and the Director of Ahli Center for Entrepreneurship. Of course, we have a very strong collaboration as a university with NGOs. And not only NGOs, we have a very strong and close collaboration with public and the private sector as well, in terms of collaboration between the university and the industries. And this is in order to close the loop and in order to bridge the gap between what we are offering as a university and what the students are supposed to acquire from the industry or from this, uh, from this kind of initiatives. First of all, I would like to acknowledge your initiative in order to uh, link uh, the municipality as a public sector with the university. Since Ahli University has been mentioned several times, I'm also so happy to see one of our MBA students coming here and talking about uh, his achievement, which is a kind of indirect achievement to our university as well. So, um, for uh, your initiative, I'm so happy to see such kind of collaboration between your, the municipality and the different universities within Bahrain. Not only private, but also I think you have mentioned University of Bahrain and uh, Polytechnic Bahrain, which are two public universities in Bahrain. The concept of collaboration between universities and the industry and the different public or private sector is really well known concept worldwide, mainly that there are a lot of uh, lab and centers and research centers which are working closely with different uh, uh, industries in order to come up with ideas or uh, copyrights or new products or innovation and so on. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, now you, my question related to your project, and you said that you have been approaching different and several universities, uh, but your folks mainly uh, aware regarding one specific aspect. Uh, as a university, we are really open and we are willing to take uh, uh, that to take the lead in order to conduct research either from the, the faculty side or the student side in different, let's say, fields, not only related to the agriculture, as you have mentioned, or IT or whatever. We are interested to do more research and in collaboration for projects either for undergrad or postgrad or why not PhD related to business, related to media, related to design or whatever specialization that we are offering. And, uh, I need to know your willingness and your degree of openness toward other very diversified portfolio of uh, research or project that maybe could entrust you as a public sector from our side as a private university. Thank you for making it long. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. yeah. clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor, very much. And we are happy to hear like you. Uh, and it is open for all the world and who, who is representing the words here. And uh, we open our cooperation also. We benefit from different sectors of a private. And uh, the cooperation, as you said, it is uh, open for in, uh, in different uh, subjects, uh, especially Ahli University. They we treat them, or they treat us as uh, consultants. Actually, I did my research with the help of university, uh, Ahliya University professors. And many things 
by their consultancy. Thank okay, you. Thank, th thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud. Actually, I would like to keep my word by... Uh, okay, uh, oh, okay uh, uh, Ali, so go on. Where is Alam? He was here and he just disappeared. Okay, uh, I'll give Ali first, please. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my, name on, is, my name is Ali Youssef and I'm a fresh graduate from Aliyah University. My question was, uh, what, what are the benefits for the students doing these kind of researches? As, as students will be doing these researches part of their curriculum, but for them personally, what will, what will be the benefit for, uh, for them? And, and don't you think like if there is no budget, some research, qualities, some research quality might drop down? How can you maintain such a, such a problem? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Ali. Uh, as you know, uh, a lot of students, when they want to do a research, uh, they don't know in which manner, in which subject they do. They don't have the problem. Yani students have the problem of no problem. So, uh, now, we give them the wealthy of topics, the real issues. So they will do the research and they will broad in, in their countries. Yeah, and the money, the subject of money, either we, with, with us or with, other, with others, or other subjects, other problems, other research, they will, they will not get the money. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and they will have the, the broad that they solve a problem in their neighborhood, in their country, in the front of others. Uh, I, I agree with the self-satisfaction that one can get. I think, uh, as usual, I will, I will give Alam the last word. Uh, please be, be brief, and because I don't want to overrun. I'm very inspired, and I'm not going to abuse my position as well. But uh, uh, I, was, I was really very moved by what you did, uh, Mahmoud. And, and I would like to propose the following. I'm sure I will consult colleagues. We propose an award. Really, you have the honor of having that because uh, that any university from across the world, you don't need to have them from Bahrain. They can be from California solving one of your problems. So, for example, agriculture, the top university in the whole world, I think, I'm not, I'm not promoting them, but the Royal Agriculture University might be bringing the best of their research to solve your problem in Bahrain. So what I'm going to propose, WSD will award any university which will provide research solutions to any country in the world, we give them an award of uh, whatever we call it, because this is exactly what we did in, uh, in 2004 with my colleague Justine Stein, one of the founders of this was. We have uh, written a big paper now being referred to it as the European Union. We call it uh, International Scientific Cooperation for, for Sustainable Development, European Union as a model for that. And what we argue is there are problems that cannot be solved unless scientists in the, the developed countries can work closely with scientists in the developing countries. So malaria, no one in the UK can solve the problem of malaria unless they work with scientists in Africa. We also talked about HIV, and that paper has been referred to in the policy of the European Union. So. I am just inspired by what you said. Why not? Because this is exactly what they think uh, governments and councils like you, they do have lots of problems they need to be solved. Some universities, they're looking for case studies to be investigated by their students. So why we make this as an announcement? Every university in the whole world, not just necessarily part of WAST, if they can, we will, co we, we will collect all the problems from across the world, from Ghana, Bahrain, whatever it is, and then we will, we will make them in a big portal, and then universities can come through us to, to be connected with the end users. But not necessarily this problem is in Bahrain and to be solved by the UK. It could be a problem in the UK to be solved by a, by a university in Bahrain. And in true fact, and in true fact, those people, I'm not going to spoil their presentation tomorrow, but what they have done in Bahrain, we have showcased it to a big uh, committee in the UK combating terrorism. So they the, they the steering committee in the UK, in London, and part of it, they are combating terrorism. We showed them a case study from Bahrain. So learning I, I not necessarily be... This so is, I think this is just in a positive note. Yeah. I think it's very inspiring work. I'm really pleased to see it. 
Thank you very much, Alam. I think this is a very positive note where I would uh, like actually to bring this to a close. But before that, I want to thank the co-organizers, JIU and WASD, for organizing this conference. I would also like to thank uh, my uh, helper here, uh, Willem, for running this uh, session, my speakers, and above all, you, the audience, for making the session so interesting. Thank you very much. I declare it closed. Remember, if we all help and do a little bit, it will make a big difference.